So you always want to be prepared to... To set goals. To be really disruptive. Diversity is fundamental. It is just trusting those super strengths. To recover from those failures and, and learn from them. Humility looks like the softest word, but it's kind of the hardest. We ourselves are in beta mode. Life goes on. Sporting Edge, inside the mind of champions. Welcome to the Inside the Mind of Champions podcast. My name is Jeremy Snape. I'm a former England cricketer with a master's degree in sports psychology. Since retiring, I've been fortunate to work with and interview some of the world's most successful thinkers and performers. And I'm passionate about translating their habits and routines into practical strategies to help you become more successful. In each episode, I'll be dissecting a common performance challenge to help you improve your mindset, your leadership, and your team performance. To me, our mindset is the next frontier, so let's find out why. Hello and welcome to today's episode, the first stage of creating a high-performing team. Great teamwork is so powerful, yet so rare, and sometimes we don't even realise we've been in a great team until it's gone. Whether you're in business or sport, it's a fascinating area of psychology to me because our teams are in constant flux. Whether we've had success or failure, a new team member arrives, maybe someone leaves, we've got celebrations and complacency, meaning this dynamic system is always changing. We've got individuals' motivations and agendas and ambitions. And we've got rumours that can spread like wildfire when the leader leaves a gap. So being part of a team is a fascinating science. And we've almost got to be this performance detective that can try and understand these clues in the social chemistry of our group. So being part of a high performing team is a huge test of both your skill and your character. And I say character because. When we're working on our own, we can have great intentions. We can, you know, in our mind, we can say we're going to go to the gym, but maybe we make up some excuse about something that else that takes over. But when we've got a group of friends and our teammates down there, they're going to hold us accountable for our actions, not just our intentions. So leaders need to be aware of the subtle social chemistry changes that's going on on a day to day basis. And that's a never ending challenge for us to take on. As ever in this podcast, I'll attempt to guide you through this topic and I'll introduce you to some of the world class thinkers and performers from Sporting Edge's digital interview library. And I'll also be answering some of your own questions to make this as personal and practical as possible. But before we dive into today's session, I just wanted to say a massive thank you for over 1,500 downloads in our first month with the first three episodes around goals, handling pressure and coping with change. I also wanted to give a special mention to those of you who've taken the time to leave a comment and a rating in Apple, which Jonesy led the way with a five-star rating saying he loved the reference in the first podcast to being the CEO of your own business and and you were going to take that into your own world. And then we had Danster said five star again enjoyed listening to this found it both inspirational and practical and jv for victory a spirit lifting is his title and that's five stars again so thank you so much you've even said that this lifts your mood and your step on your walk into your office as you think about what might be possible so that's great for me to hear obviously i'm passionate about sharing some of these stories and insights from the people that i've met to really help you to thrive in your own lives and your own careers. So today's challenge is all about teams and it's a huge topic. So we're going to break it down into a a mini series on team culture. So this will be the first one. And for many of us, as we think about high performing teams, they're some of the best memories in our careers. It's hard to build a high performing team from scratch. I think a you know, a Lego kit or a a scientific formula is hard to come by. But maybe sometimes there are clues 
that we can take from our own experiences in the past to shape how we might build a high performing team in the future. We're going to start today's episode with a reflective insight from one of Britain's greatest Olympians, Sir Matthew Pinson, who achieved four gold medals in rowing over a 16 year period. Now, clearly, this is a massive achievement, even for somebody um, as modest as Matthew. But here's his reflection on what it takes to be part of one of those special high performing teams. We didn't just turn up the day before and go, right, well, we're the team for this. Let's go and try. It was for very often years before we were saying, this is what we're going to do. You saw what it meant to everyone around you. You, sh you saw the commitment and the sacrifice and the drive and the determination in all of those individuals. You know, I rode with six people at the Olympic Games and kind of all of them are on my speed dial, as it were. Uh, but I don't have to talk to them every day. In fact, um, I might go for weeks, if not months, without talking to them. And yet you'll walk into a room and you'll see one of the guys and you'll be kind of like, oh, I didn't know you were going to be here, some function or some sports event, whatever it might be. And you just, so much is unsaid. You don't have to say, flippin' heck, it was brilliant. In fact, I can't think of an occasion where I've ever said that. Uh, and that bond between you is almost as strong as being a family, almost as strong. It's almost a blood tie because you were there on that day and you were totally reliant on him and he on you in order to win. And that you, you know, you can't, you, you can't describe that. You can't replace that with something else. You, it's, it's a very, very special and important relationship to have with those teammates. And that's, you know, that's, that's what makes it so magical. If, I, if I'd won on my own, I would just be kind of, well, you know, great. I'm, I'm the best in the world or I was the best in the world and here are my medals. Great. But for me, it's a magical element that someone else was there too to, to be part of that. So it's brilliant to hear Matthew Pinson looking back at that special time, that magical time, that time that created a bond that was almost as strong as a blood tie. And it's really interesting to think about how that experience was forged. And it was probably born out of the adversity and the sacrifice and the striving for a collective goal. So maybe that gives us an early clue as to how these high performing teams start. Is our goal ambitious enough? Is our trajectory to this inspirational goal steep enough? Because if we're going to feel that pride that Sir Matthew Pinsent talks about and reflects on there, then it's got to be pretty transformational, this goal that we've set. So we need to do something extraordinary to achieve that warm glow of pride and satisfaction down the line. And I'm sure he didn't feel that at 6 a.m. in the river you know, on that cold Thursday morning when he didn't want to be in the boat. But all of the sacrifice, all of the struggle is definitely worth it when you hear somebody reflect on, you know, connecting, reconnecting with their teammates and just looking across the bar or the function room or the restaurant to say, we did it, we did it together. So maybe the first activity for you to think about is what's the best team you've ever been in? Maybe you're in it now, but maybe it's in your past as well. Maybe it was a school team. Maybe it was a sports team. Maybe it was a, a business project team or an orchestra or a band, something where a group of people set a goal, set off on an adventure and absolutely smashed it. So just reflect back on the best time, best experience that you've ever had in a team. What are the four or five factors that were sitting under that performance? Maybe there was a, a deep trust. Maybe there was open communication. Maybe there was great leadership. Maybe there was a clear plan. Maybe you all had really specific roles um, and maybe you challenged each other. Maybe it wasn't cozy and, and you know, a, a wonderfully soft, comfortable place to be. Maybe it was honest and, and quite brutal at times that, that gave you that spike that you needed to deliver your best game so that you could then deliver your best collective game 
And that's what delivered the results that you're so proud on now when you look back over that timeline. So when you've written down or just visualized those four or five key factors that you think were part of the team that you were um, involved with, then score your current team or the current project team that you're in against those things. Are you, if they were 100% or if they were 10 out of 10, where are you now? Maybe in communication or role clarity, you're a, you're a five or a six compared to that brilliant team's 10. It's a great exercise for you to think about. As ever, we can give you as much theory as you can take, but these practical activities are what separates us into delivering it, you know, tangibly with action steps with our own teams. So that's the first insight to get us thinking about. We've also got to start by thinking who's in the boat. We need some skill for sure, but we also need character and we need a type of team fit that's going to allow people to work together. The second insight that I've selected from our performance zone library is from a very different context. I love to look way outside of sports and in the hundred experts that I've interviewed for our digital library, um, I'm really keen to get diversity both internationally, different minds, different cultures and way outside of sports. And a few years ago, I was really privileged to meet Professor Gro Sandal from Bergen University, who's an expert in the psychology of teams in extreme environments. Now, one of Gro Sandal's roles is to work with the international space agencies to profile and monitor the astronauts and cosmonauts for the International Space Station. And in this insight, she shares a different philosophy of how the American and Russian agencies had their original selection. I was interested in that balance between picking up a group of individual superstars and recruiting them independently or actually recruiting team players that could work together in that extreme environment. This is Gro Sandal's first insight. Well, it's not always possible to balance. And, uh, but uh, these superman, these individual heroes are not necessarily the one that we want in a crew which are interdependent on each other. Uh, for example, uh, the first uh, astronaut being selected, they typically had a pilot background, uh, flying solo, very competitive, very kind of alpha males. And these are people who do not necessarily function well in a team. Um, in comparison to, uh, to NASA, who for a long while ignored psychological challenges related to spaceflight, the Russians, already from the beginning of space history, uh, they selected a crew, not individual. And if one member had problems, they would actually replace the entire crew. Some personality traits we do know that they predict ability to perform in team. But uh, most importantly is to actually to observe the team operating together uh, and uh, to use these observations in, uh, in the selection. So really interesting to think about what kind of team we want. Do we want to recruit every so often to bring a new player or a new performer into our team? And do we want them to be in our own likeness? Do we want to select individually? Because there's more chance of us being biased towards people like ourselves in that situation. Or are we actually recruiting as a team? Are we recruiting um, a, a squad of players? Are we recruiting a project team together? And we're much more likely to have diversity there when we recruit an intact team together. Also, that mindset there of the alpha performer in that particular um, idea of the space station. You know, admittedly, we're not going to be stuck in a metal tube 400 kilometers from civilization. But at times we might feel like that when we're under pressure. So balancing those alpha individual performers, maybe in a remote sales team that are out on the road for the majority of the time. Is that what we really want? Or do we want to have people that are going to be working closer together and that interpersonal chemistry is going to be really important. So that's where psychometric profiling is obviously a huge multi-million dollar business around the world. That's where that plays its part. And also, as 
as Professor Sandal talks about there, these simulations where we get a chance to see people operating in different stress testing positions of team chemistry to see how people operate. So we need to look beyond the CVs. Often we just rely on a, a set of academic skills that we look at people on face value. But it's when people are under pressure in a team environment and they're with that team for extended periods of time that we might see different character traits coming out. And that can either create a high performing culture or it can actually break that culture down as people start to dial up their individual motives rather than being selfless and sacrificing under pressure. So this is where the character traits are so important in our performance. And I know that from some of the US sports, they hired private investigators to look at some of the draft picks and the lifestyle choices that they were making because they wanted to make sure there was going to be no reputational damage for some of the big sporting franchises. So I'm not sure we all need to go to that extent, but understanding the way people perform and, and their, how their character shows up in a team environment is a critical way to developing a high performing team because ultimately every one of our individuals in that team environment has an equal share of the culture that is created down the line. So we need to think not only about somebody's skill or academic capabilities, but also the personality and the culture that they bring into the team environment every day. So let's skip forward and imagine uh, that we've picked our squad or our team and next, we need to think about why this team is different. And I received this question in from Bridget in Qatar that's all around identity in teams. Hi, Jeremy. This is Bridget from Qatar. I actually wanted to know how can a team create their own identity in order to become a high performance team? And if you have any examples. Thank you. So I love that uh, question, and I think it's so easy to dive into the mechanics of the roles and goals and the metrics and the performance elements around the team. But this idea of identity is a great place to start. We all want our team to feel special and to feel different, and we all want to play a vital role in that team. Um, and Bridget, one of the case studies that I could share in this, the best one probably is the IPL team, the Indian Premier League. So back in 2008, this was the inaugural tournament, the billionaires of India with the multinational businesses. Those owners decided that they wanted to set up their own cricket tournament that was going to be the best franchise tournament in the world. And they had an auction and bought in players from all around the world. So the likes of Shane Warne, the Australian cricket legend, was the captain of the Rajasthan Royals that I was asked to join and, and be one of the coaches of. And there were players like Graham Smith and Sahail Tambir, Shane Watson, and players from all over the world in this tournament. The West Indies, England, Sri Lanka, all the best young Indian players and also the Indian demigods, those top international sports stars. So they were all thrown into a room and each of the franchises had this unique challenge. There was no heritage behind these teams. These colours and kits and logo had been put together rather hurriedly by the marketing departments after the auction to say we're, you know, we're in blue. We are called the Rajasthan Royals. We're based in Jaipur and now we've got players flying in with completely diverse backgrounds, all at different stages of their career all flying into Jaipur, into a hotel to start building what we hoped would be a high performing team. So clearly they've all got their own career paths and stories, but we needed to try and form not just a marketing identity, but a performance identity. And that's where we needed something that was going to be both authentic in terms of what the team stood for and how it represented Shane Warne, our iconic leader but also that was going to drive performance. So some of those elements needed to drive performance, not just shirt sales. So one of the elements that we looked at there was the territory. We found that Rajasthan was a desert area where people were incredibly resourceful. They didn't have a huge amount of money or resources, but they'd survived for thousands of years in this really harsh terrain. This frontier region was so 
passionate in defending its territory, it had built some of the world's most beautiful uh, and formidable fortresses. So we visited some of those huge pink sandstone formidable fortresses and got to see how hard they were to penetrate. They were defending their territory, keeping all of their resources inside. And we thought that that would be a great metaphor for us. So the home ground for us, for the Rajasthan Royals, became called Fortress Jaipur. We spoke to the players about how they defended their honour and to keep their name. They were the underdogs, the, the Rajasthan Royals, at 67 million US dollars. Believe it or not, that was the smallest budget for all the tournament. So we asked the players about how they'd proven people wrong and proven themselves against a formidable attack in, in the opposition, whether it had been in Pakistan or Australia or England or the Caribbean. So all of a sudden, we started to create from these very diverse backgrounds a shared mindset, a shared story, a shared identity that this team would stand for. We were the resilient, resourceful underdogs that were going to defend our territory and win from any position. And this idea, as well as Shane Warne's brilliance in bowling on a spinning wicket, of course, helped us to win all of our home games at Fortress Jaipur. We defended our totals. We defended our territory. And the team fairy tale came through it, if you like. It came true. We beat the Chennai Super Kings in the final in that inaugural IPL. So this was 2008. So I am absolutely convinced that this team spirit was galvanized around this culture and this identity that each of the players almost left their own logos and badges and cultures behind and bought into this new culture where we were all going to work together selflessly to be these resilient, resourceful people who defended our territory. And I think that was a great example of a performance identity being created. You know, imagine players from all over the world wanting to belong. We want to join something that we feel part of. Well, we've got to define what it is that we belong to. And we've got to define, first of all, that central story that sits at the heart of the team huddle. And then each of us as individuals need to feel like our life story is wrapped into that story. And that's one of the second parts of making this successful start in a high performing team. So again, let's make this practical. Let's get you thinking about your team identity, whether it's a junior sports team, uh, maybe it's a, an entrepreneurial business that you're just starting out and thinking about this brand or this identity and how that's going to play. Or maybe you're an established business that's lost its way. I actually did some work a few years ago with a major corporate that had forgotten, it had become a bit bland. It was like all the other people in its industry sector, but they went back to their founding story despite the thousands of staff and found that, you know, two people set this business up with a purpose, a central purpose. And, and that became, you know, reconnecting with that founder's story actually became as, as valuable today as it was, you know, 50 or 80 years ago, whenever the business was started. So think about your logo, you know, what, what does that symbolize? And is that being brought into the performance arena? What are the colors? What are the symbols? What's the territory? You know, I spoke about Rajasthan. What's the area that you look after? Is there anything there that can be brought together to create this warrior mindset or this competitive mindset? that can start to bring what seems like very disparate people and diverse people together around a shared story and a shared identity. So we've got our second question now, which is all about taking this shared vision forward. And it comes from Shubha. Hi, Jeremy, it's Shubha. I'm wondering what advice you've got for a new leader of a team in getting buy into a shared vision. Well, it's a really interesting consideration because I guess there's two things to think about, Shubha. The first is, is it a, a new leader of a new team? Are we starting this up from scratch in that sort of entrepreneurial startup phase? Or is it a new leader coming into an existing team? So I know from working with a lot of the elite football managers in the UK that this transition can happen regularly and very quickly. So we often speak about assessing the situation to be able to hit the ground running and get some very quick wins. 
So it's almost like we need to do some of this detective work to understand the crime scene because something must have gone wrong. Maybe there were some key influences that had a difference of opinion. Maybe there's something missing in the strategy or maybe there's something missing in the product range in a business or maybe the discipline uh, within a culture. So there's often something that's gone wrong in that environment for us to be flown in to rescue it. So it's really important to understand, first of all, what pressures and what um, priorities there's going to be in that new environment and to understand how that fits with our particular strengths. Now, the job of any leader going into a team environment is to bring energy and clarity to make sure that the team can move forward. So the energy comes from defining a new exciting quest. We can imagine that the team has been, you know, moping around in the valley. And what our job as a leader to do as we take our new role is to show that there's higher ground. You know, we can show them the mountaintop with beautiful views and clean air that if we make this commitment and we put in the work to climb out of the valley, we'll start to take them to higher ground. But we've definitely got to disrupt the status quo, change some of the habits, change some of the products, change some of the behaviors, change the way the team is communicating to get up and get out of this position that we're currently in. And we only get that opportunity once. Now, I can't imagine a new leader coming in and saying, OK, we're going to do it exactly the same way that you've always been doing it. We've, we've got to bring in our personality and our energy and our focus to make a difference. Now, that's not to say that a new CEO or a new coach shouldn't come in and say, I'm going to watch and listen and speak to a lot of the key players around the dressing room and around the office to understand where the priorities are. But we've got to signal that change is imminent and we're going to do something inspirational and aspirational to get people excited to put in the commitment that they need to improve performance. So if we start to get this ambition right, then we start to redefine the way people see themselves operating in that team. And when the team starts to work together and sacrifice, then we start to see success come. And then as the success builds, people externally start to perceive the club or the business in a very, very different way. So it starts from, first of all, the, the sort of hearts and minds of the individuals. And then as we start to build out more performance, that's when our reputation or our share price um, goes up outside from our team or from our business. And one example I remember from my playing career, zooming back quite a few years now, is playing for the Gloucestershire cricket team. And, and we hadn't won a trophy or the, that club hadn't won a trophy for about 25 years, I think, at this particular time. And they'd brought in a new innovative coach from New Zealand called John Bracewell. Uh, myself, um, I was brought into that team and they targeted some really um, high quality players from around the world to come and join that team. And over that period of around three seasons, we won all of the one day trophies and it became a really dominant era for this club that hadn't won anything for a, a long, long time. And really importantly, I remember what John Bracewell did. He made us to start thinking that we were re redefining the standards of the English game. And it felt like a really exciting project and quest to be part of. And one of the mindset shifts that he did during that period, I remember it clearly because it was pretty brutal the way we went about it, was that we just felt like we were cricketers and we just needed to be fit enough to run between the wickets and go and fetch the ball. And that was pretty much the mentality of, of cricket at that time. We were pretty fit, but certainly not compared to some of the other elite sporting environments and the Olympic sports. But John brought in this mindset that if we could get 20% fitter and think of ourselves as athletes who played cricket rather than just cricketers who needed to be moderately fit, then we would actually have so much more stamina, we'd make such much better decisions. And at the time when all the trophies were being fought and contested at the end of the season, we would still be fresh, you know, and energetic and be able to deliver our best game. Now, as we started to see, you know, beyond the shared suffering of those fitness tests and those gym sessions 
we started to feel that we actually were starting to perform better. We started to see each of our players around us striving. And, you know, even though we all felt tired or we didn't want to do the training, we were suffering together. And I think there's definitely something in that. Now, when we saw each other holding back our own personal agendas or our own personal comfort zone in this quest and driving forward and physically seeing people sacrifice, often to the, to the limits, then we knew that everyone was serious. We knew that everyone was buying into this goal. And that level of extra graft really helped to build and fuse this team together. It built a shared trust and a shared sort of reliance that we took onto the pitch and we became pretty formidable. Now, I'm not saying you've got to, you know, do some incredible fitness training together, but I do think sacrifice is the element that we can use here to build the team together and that extra hard work of hitting a project deadline or working with your team to put in an extra shift to fix a client issue to make sure that the business's reputation stays high. Those kind of things are a little bit like Matthew Pinson said, you can look across at each other and say, we didn't have our personal agenda dialed up. We had our you know, collective sacrifice dialed up because we were all moving forward towards this team goal. So I think this emotional story or this context is really important, Shubba, to make sure that we are able to create a shared vision. And I think, first of all, being able to articulate that as a, as a story for a leader of a new team or to, to reboot a current team if you're going in as a new leader is really, really important. And one of the examples I often use if I'm facilitating a, a team workshop is this book, The Seven Basic Plots, which is by Christopher Booker. And it's a pretty in-depth look at um, all the books that have ever been written, all the plots that have ever been written. And Christopher Booker distills them down into a series of seven basic stories or seven basic frameworks. And there are a number here that we can use for our own benefits when we're thinking about our own story. So the first one that could be useful is overcoming the monster, which might be you taking on a big opposition that's maybe got a better heritage or, or a more traditional product or, or more money. Um, the second one might be rags to riches. And this you can imagine was Leicester City's quest to do something that had never been done before on a tiny budget. Then we've got the quest. And this is the first time that things have ever been done before. You're trying to disrupt the market. So you can imagine that Google or Airbnb and Uber have got this quest that they're trying to redefine the market. Or actually, it might be an example of rebirth where we've got in, in literary terms, we've got Sleeping Beauty coming back to life. Or we've got Marks and Spencer's, the British business that seems to want rebirth all the time to get back to its former glory. So have a look at the seven basic plots. There is comedy and tragedy, which I presume you don't want as part of your business strategy. And I think uh, Voyage and Return is another one. But which of those stories is going to be relevant for you? Which can you integrate as a leader into your team environment? Because when we start to create that emotionally engaging story, that's part, that's the first step in creating this shared vision. Now, the second part, Shubba, for your specific question is that then we've got to think about how we communicate it because you did mention a shared vision. So people are motivated when they have a buy-in both to the strategic direction that we're going in, but also some of the tactical level execution. And obviously, when we've got a global you know, business with thousands and thousands of staff, it's very difficult to get this kind of buy-in at every level. But we're expecting the leaders to lead, but we also want the business to feel understood in the way the new strategy has been shaped. So we covered in podcast three about it can sometimes feel disarming when change is done to us. So we need to avoid that drop off in motivation that can come. And I've selected another insight from our performance zone library here, which I love. And it's from one of the world's most successful cricket coaches, Gary Kirsten who explains very humbly an error that he made as he broadcast his new plan in excitement 
as a brand new coach of the almighty Indian cricket team. So this is Gary Kirsten talking about how to make sure you co-define your team vision. The perfect team culture, I, I, I don't think it does exist, no, because I think every team is has got a different characteristic and a different way about them. And I think it's a responsibility of the head coach to understand that dynamic. And when I worked with the Indian team, I came as a South African to the Indian team and I needed to understand their way. When I arrived there, I presented a vision to them, which they just didn't, it meant nothing to them, that vision. That's the way I saw the game. That's the way I thought we should play. But it meant nothing to them. It was, it was going straight over the top of their heads and it made me realize, hold on, let me understand the, their way a little bit and then sort of shift it into the, into the right space, I guess, in many ways. But I think uh, the one danger we can have as, as head coaches and lead coaches is to present a way which is the way going forward. Um, I think you've got to be flexible within what you have in your resources. And you've got to say, well, this is my way, that's my best thinking, but I've got to move a little bit there, and their way or this team or this group of people have got to come to me a little bit because I'm the leader. And at the end of the day, if we don't get the type of results, I'm going to be fired and you guys are going to continue being average. So we've got to find a middle road. And I think if you can find that middle road, you can have a whole lot of fun, number one. Um, and number two, I think you can maximize performance. So again, I love him sharing that very honest story. You can imagine him sitting there in the shade of Table Mountain in, in Cape Town, making his master plan and then flying out to Mumbai or wherever that first meeting took place with some of the mega stars of world cricket, like Sachin Tendulkar and MS Dhoni, um, sitting in the room and him saying, this is how we're going to do it. And them having an opinion, of course, they were at the peak of their career. So it wasn't all lost, despite that first hurdle being stumbled over. Gary is an incredibly emotionally engaging coach. And he got some of those players to have the most successful period of their careers. And actually that culminated in the 2011 World Cup victory, which is a great memento in, in his trophy cabinet. So an incredible leader, but a powerful reminder for all of us that especially when we've got senior players or senior stakeholders, that we need to get their buy-in. This isn't a line of code that we're entering as a command into an IT program. This is human beings who need to understand what we're saying. They need to feel understood themselves. They need to believe the story and the strategy. They need to be inspired by it, that they're going to get personal benefit as well. And they're going to own it because when it becomes their plan, that's when we really start to see things motor. So setting that strategic direction intent needs to be aspirational, but we can ask questions and get input from the bottom up to really give us the full picture. And that's when things really start to move from a compliant state of affairs, which might work in the short term if we've got to resolve a particular problem. But what we're really looking for is engagement over the long period. And that's where we need to get this buy-in at all levels. So a couple more questions from you. Um, one came through to hello at sportingedge.com and it's from Stephen. Hi, Jeremy. I'm loving the podcast so far. Regarding creating a high-performing team, I'd like to hear your thoughts on how to create a shared sense of purpose and vision amongst a team of talented individuals who have their own ambitions and motivations. So thanks, Stephen, for that question. And it's a really good one. Again, as we talk about teams, there are actually individuals within it that have got their own motivations, their sensitivities, different stages of their career, different skills, different vulnerabilities, different seniorities. And the next thing that we've got to do is make sure that we're listening and understanding their particular uh, position and trying to weave that into this team narrative that we're trying to create. And this has got to be done in a way that's authentic. We care about those individuals being successful as well as the team's success, because only through that really solid foundation of bringing the individual into the team, we get trust. We get them committing their full skills and personality into that environment. 
and that's when we deliver success. So finding out about each individual person's aspirations one-to-one -one could be a key part of this process as we move forward. So the selection that I've made here to answer this particular question, Stephen, is from Paul McGinley. He's in our performance zone with lots of different insights about how he won the Ryder Cup. Absolutely fascinating interview about his victory in 2014, bringing together those individual brilliant performers. Remember, golfers spend most of the year out on their own competing against each other. And he had to bring them together very quickly to galvanize that diverse group into a European team that could beat the USA. And he did that. And this is part of the interview where I spent a fascinating day with Paul McGinley, hearing his leadership insights. And this is him talking about that team bond that he created. Building trust within a team uh, very much comes from the leader. Um, treating everybody as individuals, learning their background, finding out their background, and be respectful of their background, all helps um, when you then have to communicate with those individuals. Um, being respectful for the history of the company or the history of the football club or history of the Ryder Cup team, whatever it may be, I believe is very important um, to extending a legacy. Um, creating something to aspire to as a team uh, along the lines of where the company or where the, the team has come from, to me, is very important. So there's continuity in a path. The players or the businessmen are part of something much bigger than just being successful. The first thing the players saw when they walked into the um, area where the team were, were the rooms we were going to use, um, was uh, a roll of honour on the wall of every player that ever played uh, Ryder Cup for Britain and Ireland and Europe. And I wanted them to feel that history, to feel part of that history, um, and that to identify with that history. Um, and I had a romantic idea that in 20 years time, uh, 30 years time when we're all finished our careers and we're old and grey, um, not that I'm not grey now, uh, walking into a pub and feeling a bonding with somebody that we shared experience uh, in Glen Eagles with. That's my romantic idea of what we wanted to create. Something very bonding um, between all the players that would last a lifetime. So again, I love Paul McGinley's insight there and how he brought the history of the Ryder Cup team into the current challenge where the players, these talented individuals, were walking into that first meeting. And it wasn't about them anymore. It was about this, you know, huge history that had gone on for decades before them. And they were a tiny part in that. So in a way, he shrunk down their ego and got them to sacrifice and think about well, your name is going to be on this list now. So what difference are you going to make? What are you going to leave behind with the heritage? And, and what are you going to bring into this team that you're going to be proud of? And then fast forwarded it to think about when we're sitting in a pub in 10, 20 years time, we'll look back at this moment. So let's make sure we sacrifice and bring all of our character together to deliver something special. So that ability to flex the timeline, both with the heritage and the lineage that we've inherited in our company or business, and to fast forward it and think, what do we want to be proud of in the future? That sort of visualization is really, really important. But the most important thing is, what are we going to do now to drive performance and bring this group of people together? So again, have a think about the history in your business. What, what have you achieved? What's your heritage? What's your you know, reputation for innovation or product or customer service that stands you in great stead to bring in a brilliant team together now. And if you had to look forward to two years time, three years time, what do you want to be sitting around with this group of people in your squad, in your project team, having delivered? How do you want to have, you know, behaved? So a really nice insight to think about individuals coming together and in, in developing what went on to win the Ryder Cup, clearly, and another great high-performing team story from our library. So the next question comes from Alex, and this came through LinkedIn, just to me, Jeremy Snape. Uh, so please do send them through there. How about coming in to lead a team that doesn't see itself as high-performing? So this is an interesting point from Alex. How do you support or expedite the self-recognition of team members, their own talents, to allow for collective engagement and to find those 
challenging shared goals. So that's really interesting because um, there's a few parts to this, I guess. First of all, we've got to get clarity around the ambition, Alex. We've got to see that this goal is achievable because if people don't feel that um, they're capable of achieving the goal, then it's just not going to happen. So either it's unrealistic and that might need recalibrating. We've just gone off on one and painted this picture of being the world's best ever team and, and we don't have the firepower for it. So let's not get carried away. Let's make it realistic, a stretch, absolutely, but realistic. Um, and the second thing that could have happened is they perhaps with their confidence or competence level at the moment can't see how they're going to achieve it. So this is where we need to be able to map out the path so that they can see what's possible. So we need to show them how it's going to be possible, not just, you know, what the top of the mountain might look like. The second thing is about do we really understand and have we got a, a realistic appraisal of what we've got in the team at the moment? Often when teams are approaching pressure or big tournaments, we can lose a bit of that confidence and, and um, strength in our team. And I actually ran a, a senior level corporate exercise with a team recently where they were approaching a, a big challenging period of disruption in their business. And we had to get a few things out discussed in the open. So that was one part of it. But the second thing was to to recognize the talent that was in the room. And we gave that sort of safe space to give specific feedback to each of the individuals in the team. They sort of sat at the front and the rest of the team had given some thought to that particular individual strengths, what everybody appreciated about how they performed and what contribution they made and what impact they made to this team. But then they also gave some advice or some guidance about what was needed in the coming months. And it was an incredibly positive session. And again, I think setting that kind of thing up with your team can just reconnect people with that bank account of strength and success that we've got within the team ranks. And that can help us to move forward. And then I think the third part of your question, Alex, is to think about how we co-create the plan. So what does excellence in execution look like? What areas of performance do we need to be brilliant at? We need to make progress. We need a bit like my cricketing example, that we were getting fitter week by week. We could see that confidence growing. So maybe we need to identify what world class looks like for us as a project team. And if it's I don't know, excellence in sales conversion or understanding our customer more, uh, we need to set some goals and some parameters on that. And the team can do that so that then we identify those daily gold medal habits that, that we can start to move forward on. We can focus on them more. We can celebrate those small wins and that becomes contagious. And that's how we brill, build our confidence. And remember, our confidence is our preparedness. And if we can see that clear plan and that we're making progress day to day, then when we feel like we're driving the plan because of our activity within the team, that's way better than a leader walking into the room, sticking up some big words on a flip chart and then walking out. This is absolutely about the, the sort of intent being set, but the team knowing what's possible, knowing what's needed and then moving forward and, and moving forward step by step. OK, so we've got a, another question here, another Alex. So we've got, uh, hi, Jeremy, loving the podcast. How do we build a collective team when individuals have their own sales targets and motivation? So this is uh, a very, very popular topic. Um, I've done a lot of sales conference keynotes on this particular idea of independence versus interdependence. and. First of all, we've got to realize the benefits and flaws of the motivations and rewards we've created in our environment. So I think in a lot of our, you know, I'm not sure what your culture is like, but this dog eat dog sales competition can absolutely boost sales um, where people are on a, a very low basic salary and a very high commission proportion. But in that rabid frenzy of dog eat dog, um, you know, some of the wild dogs can take chunks out of each other as they try and protect their territory uh, and their clients. So we've got to think about maybe an analogy from sport that could help you here, Alex, is one of the rowing coaches that uh, we interviewed spoke about in the run up to the Olympics. They will have multiple overload athletes getting ready for a, 
So say it's a, a four seat in rowing, then they might have six or seven athletes that are training and competing to drive up the standards, those internal standards of fitness and technical elements and tactical elements and timing. So all of those, that really internal competitive environment is driving up the standards. But we need to see that actually it's more cooperative than competitive. So we're actually all competing against each other to drive up the national team standards. So there will become a tipping point in each of these environments where our personal motive overrides the team working interdependently if For example, we've got people just being rewarded for their own targets. They'll start stealing each other's clients and sabotaging other people's success so that they get it for themselves. So it becomes counterproductive as the team cannibalizes itself. So we've got to start to think about the tipping point and the balance. So this comes back to one of those early elements of what what kind of culture do we want to set up in our team? Because if we got shared goals and and shared bonuses for what we win together, and importantly, how we win, then it could create a very different culture. So imagine if we had 30% of our bonuses for what I deliver personally, but 70% of my personal bonus comes from the way the team performs. And maybe it's based on client feedback or a a trust pilot review or something like that, which, which takes it away from these sort of minute by minute conversations and and grabbing the latest deal and more into this higher scale reputation for the business. So we need people to be selfless and to be driven um, and to recognize other people's success. So again, maybe it's not the structure and the reward that we put in place, but when a coach recognizes somebody not shooting selfishly at goal, but actually passing the ball to somebody who is in a better position and that selfless act that deserves to be praised in the team environment, even though that striker is all over the newspaper for scoring the goal. It's the person that did the assist that the high performing environment would praise because they they won't get that registered. They don't get that uh, adulation. But that selfless act is something that high performing team will celebrate just as much as the person ripping the shirt off and, and celebrating the goal you know, so passionately. So it's such a fascinating subject. And I think we've just scratched the surface here. So I'm going to create some more podcasts around these further elements of building the team because there's just so much to cover. So in the next few episodes, we'll be covering areas like role clarity, goals, uh, how we build trust in a team, how we manage conflict. Maybe we need to set a behavioral code and some team rules. And then we'll start to look at purpose that brings the team together even more. And then once we've got our team operating successfully and the results are beginning to come, then we'll look at the things that can derail the team, maybe uh, the mavericks that come in and want to do it their own way, or maybe how we start to get complacent and we need to sustain our motivation and success and our hunger despite successful results. So that's later down in the team journey. So We'll start with this one today. And if you've got any questions about those next stages, please do send them through via LinkedIn to Jeremy Snape or via email to hello at sportingedge.com because I'd love to hear your questions about the second and third and fourth phases of the high performing teams. And I'll definitely answer those using our insights from the high performance digital library that we've created. Now, I've also had some questions through about how you can access the video. So I've shared a link with those individuals that have written in via hello at sportingedge.com. But I thought I'd just mention here, if you visit sportingedge.com and select digital coaching programs from our drop down menu around products and services, you'll see the two digital coaching programs that myself and our expert team of learning and psychology experts have, have created. So this features all of our digital video insights, the practical activities, the workbooks, the research, the white papers, discussion forums and coaching webinars. And you also can ask questions to me directly and I'll answer those as part of these programs. We've had over a thousand uh, delegates through these programs and there are two main types. The first is the winning mindset, which is a 30 day 
experience where every morning at 7 a.m. you'll get a five minute video from me and a well-being expert or a, a, an Olympian or a neuroscientist around elements like personal drive, confidence, focus, well-being, performing under pressure, resilience. And that's really going to help you to deliver your best performance at work. And the second program, which was built off the success of that individual program, was around the winning mindset for leaders. So this is about fast tracking your skills and your confidence as a leader so that you can get promoted or deliver an even bigger impact. And that looks at three key areas about leading yourself. So you've got your strengths and your mindset and your career goals. Then it's about leading others, motivation, driving a, a team, maybe coaching and, and inclusive leadership. And then the third module of that particular 12-week program is around leading the organization. And this is where we've interviewed business strategists and innovation experts and, and experts on leading change and managing data and technology and disruption. So some brilliant academic professors and futurists there to guide you on all of that. So again, sportingedge.com have a look at the digital coaching programs and if you like the look of those we we run those quarterly and it's a real build on some of the content that you're seeing here but to wrap up this particular session i really hope you found it interesting and informative if you're kicking off a new team or you're giving your team a reboot then these strategies will definitely make a difference to your culture and your results just to recap on some of those key points we've we've touched on. Do people know why this team exists and what you're here to do? Have you got an inspirational and an aspirational quest and a story? Do people know why this team is different? Remember that Rajasthan case study about, you know, being the underdogs and being the fortress and, and really defending our territory. What is it in your unique identity and rituals that can stand out and bring people closer to the team? Have you set that strategic intent and invited them to finalise and, and contribute to the delivery with Gary Kirsten's great insight? We want engagement, not just compliance, remember. And have you connected the aspirations of the individuals and their particular individual story with the overall team story so that they feel like they win. If they sacrifice to this team and the team's goals, then they win. And there's no doubt for me that by being, uh, you know, having the best season for that team at Gloucestershire, I got a chance to play for England. So that's a great example of working hard as part of a team and getting personal goals back as a result. But if I'd been selfish and just thought about that, it wouldn't have worked. So... I really hope you're enjoying the tips and insights from the show. So please do post this link into your social feeds or LinkedIn to spread the word. If you can give it a rating or a comment on Apple or Spotify, I'll mention that in the next show. And please do keep your questions coming. I'd love to make this as practical and useful for you as possible. So send your questions through to hello at sportingedge.com. I'll be back soon with another insight into the psychology of high performance but in the meantime good luck with your team and i'll see you soon <laughs>